share your comment. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speakers. Dave Williams of the Brailleist Foundation. Since 2014, the Brailleist Foundation has been connecting UK Braille users with Braille product manufacturers and building a community of Braille enthusiasts. In 2020, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, activity went online and the Brailleist community was made global. This through remote Braille for Beginners courses, masterclasses, a book club, a podcast, email distribution groups, and drop-in sessions, perceptions of Braille within the community have grown exponentially more positive, and collective enthusiasm about Braille has piqued the interest of external organizations and individuals who were previously unconvinced about Braille's future. Both Matthew and Dave have been instrumental to the work of the Braillus Foundation, Matthew as general manager and Dave as the chair. The title of their presentation today is Revitalizing Braille Through a Grassroots Community. So thank you to you both, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Well, thank you, Natalie, and a very good evening to you all from the UK. I guess it's mostly afternoon uh, where you are, but it's evening over here. Um, my name is Matthew Horspool. Uh, as Natalie said, I'm the general manager of the Braillists Foundation. I have been uh, since the post was created in October 2021, but I've actually been part of the Braillists for a lot longer than that. Um, I was the secretary for a couple of years before that. I've been mean, since before the pandemic, I've been the secretary. Um, I did a bit of the uh, financial administration and uh, also have been instrumental in the Brailcast podcast for quite a long time. And we'll uh, talk more about that as we go through the session. My background is actually in computer science, but I, uh, when I left university, decided that perhaps computer science wasn't really where I wanted to end up. And so while I was deciding where I wanted to end up, I got a job as a Braille transcriber at a school for the blind. And so I've been involved in the Braille industry in one way or another ever since. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you all tonight. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to come along. Um, looking at the participants list, there's some people who I know and many more who I don't. So it'd be wonderful to be able to present to you all. I'll just pass over to Dave to introduce himself and then we'll get started with the session properly. Hello everybody, a very warm welcome and it is a huge honour and a privilege to be with you. I'm Dave Williams. If you recognise my voice, it may be from a previous life as the director of ACB Radio. Um, as well as community media, I also have a background in assistive technology. I've worked with software and hardware companies in the field over the last uh, 20 years. I was involved with the Braillists uh, since 2014 and in 2020 when we registered with the Charity Commission in the UK, I was invited to become its chair. Uh, I'm a blind dad and I always share the fact that my Braille epiphany came uh, when I became a parent and I couldn't find a better way uh, to read the bedtime story. So uh, let's get underway and let's share with you how the power of community has promoted Braille in the UK and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to go through in this session how we support beginners to get started with Braille, how we support existing Braille users to advance their skills in specific areas of Braille, and then how we reach out to partners to promote the value of Braille. And when we talk about promoting the value of Braille, we're not just sort of talking about, oh, well, yes, you know, Braille's important and what are you doing about it? We really want to be part of the solution to that. And so we'll talk about that as we go through as well. So as Natalie said, the Braille, the Braillist Foundation has existed since 2014. If we think back to 2014, Braille readers in the UK were really quite isolated. Um, 
we had the Braille Authority of the UK uh, that got merged into an organization called the UK Association for Accessible Formats, uh, which is doing sterling work. But it did mean that we, <clears throat> excuse me, we didn't have an organization that was purely focused on Braille. And so all these Braille readers were in the UK sort of vaguely, some might have known about each other, but a lot were in isolation. Uh, there was a lot of isolation through as well, but the mainstreaming of people, so people not going to blind school and not meeting up with other blind people that way. And, and really, I mean, there was all this passion about Braille, but it was all very disconnected. And then Bristol Braille Technology came along and they needed a focus group for their Canute multi-line Braille display. So a bunch of Braille users got together in Bristol to meet Bristol Braille and to look at the Canute. And they realized that actually, all right, they enjoyed looking at the Canute, but they also enjoyed talking about Braille. And so they decided to set up some groups that then sort of became the Braillists Foundation, as it was. And um, those groups just talked about Braille and Braille history and Braille products. And they, uh, they, they talked about, you know, a lot of that sort of thing. Uh, they moved out. So we had a group in Reading and a group in Dublin. And then... Um, we realized, I think, around about sort of 2017, 2018, that if we wanted to do much more, we would need some money. And the best way to get money is through grant funding. And you, you need to be a charity in order to get grant funding. So we set up as a charity. Um, around about that sort of time, uh, Dave had this brilliant idea to launch a podcast called a Braillecast, which was designed actually to promote Braille to people who'd never heard of Braille before, so or, or people who were only on the fringes of Braille. So the initial audience for that was QTBIs, uh, Qualified Teachers of the Visually Impaired uh, Rehabilitation Officers, you know, uh, Orientation and Mobility Specialists, that sort of thing. Um, but I mean, that quickly grew into a podcast, not just for those, but also for Braille readers themselves. And um, all of this was happening. And then we had COVID. And so COVID kind of completely changed our direction of travel, really. We were looking at setting up more face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, obviously, face-to-face -face meetings with COVID didn't really happen. What really needed to happen with great urgency was bringing the community together like never before so that the community could share how they were getting on with the pandemic. Um, things like online shopping, uh, how were they managing that when there were no slots available, all of that sort of thing. And so the Braillists, because we were very small, could move very agilely. And so we set up these community calls just to bring the community together. And that was really all we could all we could think of at the time. We weren't too worried about Braille. We just wanted to make sure that everybody in the community was safe. And um, we did this. And that taught us a lot about how to run Zoom meetings, about you know things that we now take for granted, like raising hands and muting people and unmuting people and all of the technical sort of sides of this. And it got our name out there. And so from there, we were able to develop other Braille things uh, and, and, and sort of drill back down into Braille and, and our core purpose. And so we now have in 2022, a pathway for progression in terms of our events that are now all Braille related, right the way through from beginner to expert. And it's all sort of just evolved over time. So we're gonna talk about those events in turn, and I'm gonna turn back over to Dave to talk about Braille for Beginners first. While we were running our wellbeing calls every Friday at six o'clock that were very well received and very well uh, attended, and we also ran some, some mindfulness sessions and also how people could get access to um, you know, just the essentials of, of life. I was very aware that we needed to uh, to get back to Braille at some point. And I saw a post on social media from Jenny Langley, who is a uh, qualified teacher of the uh, visually impaired, offering to teach people Braille during lockdown. And really without any plan, I approached Jenny and said, would you like to do this through the Braille lists because we've got people turning up every week. We need to get back to Braille. And uh, I didn't even know at that point, you know, is it even possible to teach Braille over Zoom? Uh, but Jenny was up for it and uh, she came along and she launched our first Braille for Beginners course. Uh, there've now been three. Um, and I'd like to think that each time we run the course, um, it improves. So who goes on um, those courses? Who comes on the Braille for Beginners course? Well, the first group are lapsed Braille readers. When we transitioned to UEB in the UK, there were some readers who struggled with that bump and um, others that had just kind of put Braille down uh, after school. Um, so we did have a cohort of people who I would describe as lapsed Braille readers who were looking for a way back in. 
We also have people who have lost their sight later in life and have tried to access Braille tuition through more traditional means through their local rehab support. So I think of those people as almost latecomers um, to Braille. Unfortunately, uh, as I'm sure is the case in, in many parts of the world, um, the rehab support for adults learning Braille is patchy at best. And then there are also the parents and the supporting professionals, those sighted people, perhaps non-Braille readers who get it, who understand that Braille is simply a way of redrawing the alphabet so that it can be read by fingers rather than eyes. And testament to the success of Braille for Beginners is the fact that our third course attracted over 150 people uh, registered uh, to, to sign up for that course. Um, and I think at least half of those people did indeed go through and complete it. The Braille for Beginners course focuses very much on reading practice. There are, of course, courses on, online where you can uh, learn to write Braille. I'm thinking particularly of, of UEB online uh, from Australia, which does a, a fantastic job. But really, the only courses available for adults in the UK were distance learning courses. So you could approach RNIB, our National Blindness Organization, and they would send you a Braille course in the post, and it's a self-study course. And what was missing, really, was the peer support, that sense of um, community. So we've tried to create that and we were forced to create that really by the, uh, the pandemic. So we set up our Google group for our beginners. Um, we also made sure that our tutor um, was available uh, to provide regular support via email and of course in the you know, conferencing environment. And we make recordings of our sessions available for those that can't make the session because many people are adults, they've got children, life gets in the way sometimes. And we also provide uh, a written summary there as well. The course is based on Fingerprint, which is a well-established and well-regarded course from RNIB. Um, and as we have evolved the Braille for Beginners, we have started to provide our own hard copy materials for those that, for whatever reason, are unable to uh, provide Fingerprint. And going forward, I think the future for Braille for Beginners is uh, to make Braille for Beginners available on demand as a kind of a self-serve option, as it were, um, so that um, anyone with an interest in learning Braille can join at any time. They can go at their own pace, but we really are keen to preserve that really strong sense of community through uh, live sessions, uh, the email forum, and a tutor who will offer um, office hours. So what's the content? Well, when we started Braille for Beginners in 2020, um, you know, I was I was so glad just to get somebody to do it. I hadn't thought thought through, you know, how many weeks is this going to be? How far are we going to go into uh, to Braille? Because of course the you know the sky's the limit, as as you know. Um, so we in the first course attempted to teach all of uh, grade one and grade two, um, and that took many many weeks. And so um, we've dialed that back a bit now. Um, and essentially, Braille for Beginners covers uh, those uh, pre-Braille skills, you know, tracking, discriminating, and fine motor. Um, we teach the dot patterns for the alphabet, not in alphabetical order, but in the order that they appear in, in fingerprint. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. We can maybe talk about that in a bit. Um, we also, of course, show how to write capital letters, numbers, and basic punctuation. It's our aim to give... Um, attendees enough braille uh, to be dangerous or should that be uh, useful so enough braille for labeling enough braille for writing a greetings card enough braille uh, to play a game so that you can make practical use of your braille and of course there are some that then go on and learn contracted braille Brilliant. So we have a Braille for Beginners course. We have people coming through it and then they wonder where on earth they're going to go next. Braille for Beginners is only an hour a week. And in between that hour a week, they're kind of expected to go off and do reading practice on their own. And um, <clears throat> I think a few of the attendees of the course kind of found that a little bit isolating and wanted the opportunity to go and, and read with other people. What also happened, particularly with the first Braille for Beginners course, was that RNIB was unable to access the Braille library during the first lockdown because the landlord had locked the site down. 
script. So if people wanted library books, they had to read them on refreshable Braille displays. And there was a, a massive injection of Orbit Reader 20 Braille displays in the UK uh, at, at no charge to try and facilitate that. But it meant that then there was a critical mass of people who had Orbit readers and didn't know how to use them. And some of those were beginners. So one of our original Braille for Beginners participants came to us and said, well, we'd le really like to start up a group to sort this out. And we, we called it the book club. I think probably book club doesn't properly advertise what it is that we do. Um, it's not a discussion group. It is literally a group where people come together and they take it in turns to read. And uh, Bernie, who was the, the instigator of it, I say, came from the original Braille for Beginners group, uh, a few others from the original Braille for Beginners group kind of came along and uh, and Bernie facilitated that and it was all going very well we had about six or seven people which was wonderful because everybody had enough time to do some reading and then we uh, got one person who just read so much faster than everybody else and we didn't want to discourage that person from coming but we also didn't want to discourage the people who were reading more slowly so that was when the advanced group was born so we split up into two breakout groups uh, which at the time were called the intermediate group and the advanced group. And so one or two other people were encouraged to join the advanced group and um, and everything kind of, you know, carried on. And, and there we were. Um, then, of course, the second Braille for Beginners course happened and subsequently the third Braille for Beginners course happened. And we realized that we needed more breakout rooms because the people doing the second Braille for Beginners course were obviously further behind than the people who'd done the first one because they'd started later. So we introduced a beginners group that was led by Mel, who tutored the Braille for Beginners course. And then when we launched the third Braille for Beginners course, uh, that Mel switched to that breakout group. And we managed to find somebody from the community to lead what then became the improvers group. So at all stages of this, what we were really looking for was for people within the book club to really kind of take ownership of it and to, to lead it, to support it, to be a part of it. And that goes all the way through actually in terms of um, the leadership and the facilitation of the groups, you know, who should read first, who should read second, all of that sort of thing. But also in terms of what book the book club should be reading. So each breakout group makes its own decision about what book to read. Uh, the facilitators facilitate that within a certain criteria. You know, if it's a beginner's group, you don't really want to be reading a book that's in grade two. So, you know, there's a list of books that are available in grade one and, and so on and so on. But within that list, the group really makes the decision that the group wants to make. And they generally have about 12 weeks to read each book. It goes roughly in line with the school term times. So there's an autumn term and a spring term and a summer term. And uh, it now happens, as I say, once a week on a Thursday. As well as the uh, beginners courses and the book club, we have a number of other themes uh, for our online uh, events. And uh, we'll talk about masterclasses in a moment. Um, we found that there were some readers that were keen to um, learn contracted Braille. Um, and for those, we have offered our Braille improvers sessions where we haven't gone through every single uh, contraction or 180 of them, uh, but we have introduced the concepts of, you know, what is a a, a short form what is a, a group sign and how do uh, prefixes work and and so on so we signpost to other resources and take questions and offer support um, for those looking to advance their braille another theme is our braille bar and this kind of came from a well-known technology retailer where you can go in and get your uh, questions answered so the braille bar is an open braille q a we run them uh, twice a month uh, and uh, it's a, a very broad church you can ask anything uh, and we assemble a panel of braille experts so we're lucky to be joined by mel pritchard who now heads up our braille for beginners course also james bowden uh, who is a name known to many internationally uh, james is the braille technical officer at rnib and also the uk representative to the iceb uh, and then we also have 
uh, uh, Ben Mustel Rose and, and myself. And so between us, the panel, we are able to, to deal, I think, with probably 90% of the questions that are raised, and they can cover anything from Braille code, kit, advocacy, you name it. Any aspect of Braille is very welcome in the Braille bar. And because our panel is so enthusiastic, um, they're even willing to take away homework. So if we can't answer a question there and then, uh, we're quite happy to uh, take it away and try and uh, find out um, the answer. But you'll remember, if we go back to the start of the presentation, that the core of the Braillist audience before the pandemic was long-term, well-established Braille readers. So they already knew the Braille code. I mean, some of them come to the Braille bar and find it very useful. But apart from that, what were we really offering for those long-term Braille users who'd supported us up until the pandemic and who we didn't really want to lose? And that was a question that was foremost in my mind as we were planning our activities. And the way we resolved it was to set up a series of masterclasses. And these were like every of our sessions, like all our sessions, actually, these, these are an hour long. And these are presentations given by industry experts on a topic, you know, and, and these topics are really quite diverse. So we do them on braille displays, um, you know, choosing your Braille display, but also how to use your Braille display with a particular suite of applications or operating systems. So Windows, iOS, uh, you know, presentation tools, that sort of thing. How to use Braille practically. So, you know, labeling uh, and making presentations using Braille. How to use Braille, uh, the code itself, you know, so grade three and computer Braille and all of those sorts of codes, you know, what is eight dot Braille? Uh, and so we bring in people who know about those subjects. They talk for 40 minutes or so, and there's generally about 20 minutes for questions. We can slice and dice that, dice that however we want. Some people go the full 40 minutes. Some people split it up. Some of them are more interactive than others. But, the, you know, it, it's generally that sort of ratio. We're getting, I think, probably about 50 or 60 people at a minimum to those sessions now. And we get much more reach on those through the Brailcast podcast, which we talked about earlier on. Brailcast has now become the vehicle for delivering the archives of those sessions. Uh, when it's not delivering archives of those sessions, it's delivering interviews with Braille related people, you know, so people who have, a, have an interesting story to tell or people who work for Braille technology companies and that sort of thing. And um, I say they really are very popular. We'll be continuing them into next year. We offer text transcripts of all of them now. Um, we were a bit behind for a while, but we've caught up. Um, those text transcripts uh, are in Microsoft Word format and they are available uh, from our media page and they facilitate access for people who are deaf blind. We also make a handout available covering the key points in the session. And we're also starting now to make those transcripts and those hands out available in BRF format. So for people who want to read them on refreshable Braille displays, like the Orbit reader that don't have built in translation, uh, they're available for those. The presenters are all Braille users to date, and they are all therefore blind, and they are all paid, or at least we offer to pay them. Um, we, we have a, a grant that allows us to do that, and we were very keen that that should happen because so often organisations uh, ask, you know, blind and partially sighted people to come on and donate their expertise for free. And there's, je there's definitely a place for volunteering in the, in the Braille list, but we thought that the expertise of a masterclass really did uh, you know, deserve payment. So we offer payment. We try and keep it as much as we can, you know, in line with what the industry would expect us to pay. And uh, some of our presenters have indeed taken us up on that. And it's really wonderful to be able to remunerate the community like that. You've heard about our many flavours of uh, online meetings, but what else have we done to try and uh, mobilise the community? Well, we uh, for a while ran an equipment scheme where we were able to procure some uh, slates and stylus uh, that we were able to distribute along with other uh, low cost Braille equipment. We're very envious of your Braille Bounce initiative and uh, would really like to try and emulate that someday. We also make sure that we celebrate 
key dates in the calendar World Braille Day, of course, but we also have a national uh, Braille week here in the UK in October. Uh, so we always make sure that we put on special events um, and recognize that through our, our social media. We have our uh, Braillists Forum, which is, is another uh, Google group uh, to which, uh, you know, we find all sorts of uh, fascinating questions are, are posted. We get engagement on there from various assistive technology companies and other organizations organizations as well as um, individuals um, and uh, we're, we're very lucky actually that um, we've also got support from from many uh, teachers of the visually impaired as well who often cite you know people in the, the Braillist Foundation as, as role models for their for their youngsters. Um, we have in the UK a network of local uh, blindness organisations um, to whom we uh, reach out and uh, we're also um, encouraging our community to engage with industry on things like uh, product testing and feedback. If somebody finds a braille problem and they post it on social media we, we kind of see it as almost our business to, to kind of get involved and say look you need to tell you know the manufacturer it's really important that we as braille consumers are constantly uh, feeding back about the quality of products and um, transcription. Let's turn to funding. Um, so the bulk of our funding thus far has come in the form of two grants from the Churchill Fellowship. Um, we've also received support from Bristol Braille uh, Technology um, and um, we are adamant that everything the Braillist does uh, and continues to do for the foreseeable future um, remains free at uh, point of use. We are a, a charitable foundation after all, and we don't want uh, finance to be a barrier to Braille. So at the start of the pandemic, we had our committed audience of Braille enthusiasts, but we really needed to reach further than that, particularly because what we were actually doing at the start of the pandemic was bringing the community together and we wanted to reach people who just didn't have access to the internet even. And we knew that the best place to reach those people was local blindness organisations. So you know, because we're all kind of embedded in the industry, we all kind of had our contacts in that space and we made lots of phone calls and, you know, got contact details for all of them. And, you know, some of them put us in their newsletters and some of the organizations were actually phoning around blind and partially sighted people to say, look, are you OK? And, and some of them uh, told, you know, their service users about the Braillists at that point. So we'd got quite a big audience by the time we started Braille for Beginners. But we knew that for the second Braille for Beginners course, we needed to get an even bigger audience. So we went back to those blindness organizations at that point and many more. And we also established contact with an organization called Visionary, which is like a membership organization for the local blindness organizations. And we asked if they would promote the Braille for Beginners course. Now, they were very happy to do that because what was happening was, you know, throughout lockdown, uh, people wanted to learn a new skill. And so they were being, you know, the local societies were being approached by blind people wanting to learn Braille and the local societies really didn't know where to send them. So they were very grateful to us and they were very happy to promote that course. And so we started to build extremely good relationships with local sight loss organizations, as we call them over here, um, excuse the politically correct term, and visionary that supported them. And that led to the, the, norm, the number of registrations that we got for Braille for Beginners. It also led to opportunities for us to present at some quite big conferences. Uh, Visionary has its own conference. So we were able to present not at the conference itself, but at, at a fringe event following the conference. And that was very well attended. So that was presenting to local blindness organizations on the value of Braille and how Braille is still relevant in the 21st century. A few representatives of local organizations heard that and were very inspired by it and said, look, actually, we'd like you to deliver this to our service users directly. So we've delivered one so far, and I think there'll probably be another handful of those you know, to come in the future. And we also got picked up by an organization called VIEW, which is the Industry Association for Visual Impairment Education Workforce. So this is, as I say, qualified teachers of the visually impaired uh, rehabilitation officers, uh, O&M instructors in schools, all of that sort of thing, you know, teaching assistants. Um, and so we were allowed to do a presentation at their 
conference at their main conference, uh, which was a big deal because it was launching a new curriculum framework for children with a visual impairment. And we were part of that. And we spoke about Braille and how Braille was a vital part of the toolbox and how it was complementary to speech access and not um, not not its adversary, if you like. And so we really have started to become really quite well known in the industry now as the go to people for Braille. And that's really helped us in terms of our, uh, you know, bringing new people in because everybody started to hear us or hear about us. Um, it's also been really helpful in terms of the podcast because, you know, technology companies are starting to hear about us now. They're starting to come to us and say, can we get some feedback on this? Or as far as the podcast is concerned, they're starting to come to us and say, look, you know, can we please have an interview because we've got this really exciting product to launch? And so it really does put us in a, an absolutely fantastic place going forward. We have, I think, had to adjust and change with the times as all of us have. And as chair, you know, it's my job to try and bring our kind of work streams together. And I think there are essentially three main themes that underpin the work of the Brailless Foundation. One is about breaking down barriers um, to Braille um, and uh, a core component of that is community and that actually learning in a group is uh, very powerful for reinforcing uh, learning, for accountability, for staying uh, motivated. A second theme is about uh, encouraging existing Braille readers uh, to reach our potential, to maximise our use of Braille through sharing practical use cases and uh, developing knowledge in specialist areas like music. And then finally, I think influencing uh, manufacturers and researchers and local organizations and, and national blindness organizations to help shape their thinking around Braille to ensure that Braille really does have a very strong future. So let's sum up where we are now. The Braillist is reaching over 1,500 people through the weekly newsletter that we publish. That's up from maybe two or 300 at the start of the pandemic. Um, we're averaging 200 listens a week to Braillecast. We're getting 60 to 80 attendees at each masterclass. And when we started those, we were maybe getting 15 or 20. You know, we were doing well if we got 30, but now we're doing badly if we get 50. Um, we get 20 average attendance at the Braille bar. The book club is getting about 30 uh, across all four rooms. So, you know, maybe sort of, uh, 10, sort of 10 maximum in each room. We are starting to be seen, you know, organically, as I say, as a source of expertise in the industry. And I mean, we've got lots of people to thank for that. We've got the users, the, the, the people who've been supporting the Braillists all of this time. We've also got the funders. One of the things I didn't say earlier on, which I should have done, is that we've been supported by National Braille Press and their Touch of Genius Prize. And that really was a great honour to receive that, or at least an you know, honorary mention in it. We've had our first face-to-face -face event now since the pandemic that took place in April. We're planning our second one. It's going to be a Braille and beer event to uh, to complement the Braille bar. <laughs> and the, that's going to be at Site Village and that's going to be uh, a week next Tuesday. So if you're interested in what we're doing, if you'd like to get involved, we invite people from all over the world to get involved in what we do. Many of the people who attend our events are not from the UK. Um, and we'd welcome, you know, attendance from Canada. You're very welcome to visit our website, which is braillists.org. Sign up to the newsletter, find out about the events that we run. You can find Braillecast at braillecast.com. That's all one word. And you can search for Braillecast again, all one word in your podcast client of choice. We're on all the major directories now, and we're also available on smart speakers. We really, really welcome, as I say, uh, subscribers from overseas but we welcome as well opportunities to work with other braille organizations not least braille literacy canada uh dave's mentioned that the braille bounce we're very excited about that uh the the braille zoomers the braille starter kits you know we, we'd love to sort of collaborate and work out you know if there's any joined up thinking that we have the mission of the Braillist foundation is simply more braille and i think for us what that means is if we want more Braille in the world, 
then we as Braille readers and Braille users and as a Braille community, we have to spread it. Thank you very much. And we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much to you both. Um, this is all just so exciting and everything that you're doing is so important. You mentioned the Braille Zoomers program and we're, we're really excited about that, but we we really look to you as the leaders in so much of this and it's it's so good to hear everything that you're doing to inspire, inspire us as well. Um, we do have time for questions. What we'll be doing is, so usually we'll have a 15 minute break between uh, sessions, but because we started a little bit later with the introductions, uh, we'll have a shorter break right now after the Q&A. Um, so we'll take a few minutes of questions and um, our uh, tech support will let us know if we have any raised hands, but maybe I'll just quickly start off by saying that one of the things I'm very excited about is the attention that Braille is receiving through everything that you're doing and changing perceptions. What kind of a response have you received from maybe people who wouldn't traditionally think about Braille, like uh, perhaps members of the low vision community or older adults or even just from the mainstream? I've got a bit of background noise, Matthew. Do you want to take this? Yeah, sorry, I was distracted by the chat question. Sorry. What was that? Just just summarize the question. I'm sorry. It was yeah, people that no we problem. wouldn't expect. Sorry. Go ahead, Natalie. No problem. Yeah. So what kind of a response have you received from maybe people who wouldn't traditionally think about Braille, like people with low vision or older adults or maybe just members of the sighted community? Yeah, it's really interesting because we, like you say, we really kind of expected people to respond quite negatively to it. You know, we we were, we were expecting people to sort of say, oh, well, I'm not blind enough to need Braille, um, you know, and, and things like that. And we've obviously had a bit of that. Um, I think there's some enthusiasm about Braille in that sort of people see it as a bit of a novelty at first. They sort of look at it and go, oh, that's very cute. You know, you can write the alphabet in six dots. How cool is that? And then they start to learn how to write the alphabet in six dots. And then the, eventually there's some light bulb moment and they say, oh, right, OK, yes, this is, you know, this is actually going to be useful to me. And I think that comes that one of the things we didn't really talk about was the fact that the Brailleists is, you know, entirely ran by blind people other than I think we've got two sighted people on the board of trustees. And, you know, we really value their input, of course. But, you know, the majority of the events that we run are ran by blind people. And I think what happens is partially sighted people sort of come in and they think, well, Braille may or may not be useful and, and all of this sort of thing. And then they see what we're able to do as blind people by running these events and by using Braille to support us in running these events. And then they start to think, yes, OK, well, we want a bit of that as well. And I think that really does make a difference. I think blind people talking about Braille is so much more important, uh, so much not important, but so much more impactful than sighted people talking about Braille. Yeah, absolutely. Fully agree. And excellent. I do know we have questions. So Anthony, do we have uh, raised hands? We do. So just in case anybody's on the computer and unsure how to do that, Alt Y will, will raise your hand on the computer. And we do have one hand up from uh, Natalie Osborne. Excellent. Go ahead, Natalie. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you very much for a, a fascinating presentation. Um, I am located in Montreal. I do some Braille teaching. I am a sighted person and I teach uncontracted Braille, uh, largely to partially sighted adults. Um, most of my users who have no vision have learned Braille, you know, in childhood or at school. So the ones that we tend to see are the ones who have lost vision later in life. Um, I think what you're doing is absolutely amazing and inspiring. And I, I was kind of racking my brain trying to think if we have anything equivalent in Canada, like an online learning community with Zoom meetings. Um, I think it's something that's really, really lacking. I tend to teach people in isolation. I might have one or two clients at a time. Um, and then, you know, I can connect them with some resources, but um, I think your model is excellent. And I would love, uh, I would love to see something like that exist here uh, in Canada. And I was wondering, are your courses accessible around the world? Can people from our part of the world uh, join? Yes, indeed. And, and that has 
happened. Uh, in fact, we did have in the most recent Braille for Beginners course that ran earlier this year, uh, people from the United States uh, joining us. And we were supported by uh, Judy Dixon, actually, who was willing to emboss out some of the hard copy learning resources and, and distribute those. Now, clearly, an individual doing that isn't massively scalable. So we're looking for uh, partners around the world um, who can help us with that um, by making the course available on demand as a kind of a self-serve uh, experience. We hope to you know, sort of stem the flood of, of, of requests. You know, we learned a lot about um, logistics when we were developing the most recent course about uh, actually it takes some doing even just to produce, you know, 150 packs, you know, and get those um, posted out to, uh, to people. So uh, we are thinking very carefully about how we scale now um, and, uh, you know, keep that, that personal touch and keep that sense of community. But absolutely, we are um, open to uh, participation from overseas. I should say our funding is specifically uh, for the UK to this point. So the funding we received from the, uh, the Churchill Fellowship is, is really designed to support UK uh, based organisations. But, you know, that won't always be the case. And uh, yes, yeah, certainly our, our doors are open. And, um, you know, if you'd like to get involved, you'd be very welcome. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Davina Carbon. Uh, yeah, Davina Carlson, can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you, yeah. Oh, great. Um, well, I concur with Natalie uh, just what, what said, and um, my question is actually kind of familiar to what she asked. And I'm a Braille teacher, and I primarily teach adult as well, and I'm based here in California. And uh, we do have a similar kind of here in the United States, like the Hadley School, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. But my question is, is that your beginners, Braille for beginners, is that something like I could check out and maybe adapt some of your curriculum into my teaching? Is that something you guys allow? Like a, maybe I could check the BRF file or something like that? Sure. So the Braille for Beginners curriculum actually in large part came from a curriculum that we talked about earlier on called Fingerprint. So Fingerprint was devised by someone called Nigel Berry and is very well known actually as a curriculum. We took that as a starting point and we, we went away from it towards the end so that we could cover email addresses and website addresses and things like that. But by and large, it's the Fingerprint curriculum. So if you have access to something that has the Fingerprint curriculum in it, then you know, you, you've nearly got what we've got. Um, in terms of sharing resources, I mean, I don't see why we couldn't do that. Yeah, drop us a line to help, H-E-L-P uh, at braillists.org. And yeah, I can send you a BRF file of, of the resources that we've got. Thank you. Kim. Uh, I just, I wanted to say thank you guys very much for this. Um, and the, the Braille Zoomers, so for those of you on the call that don't know, the Braille Zoomers do have monthly um, call conference calls during the year for adult Braille learners that are new to it. So some of your students too, Natalie, you know, certainly they would be welcome to join BLC and become a Braille Zoomer. And those are great. We have topics and ideas. And also I run um, through the Canadian Council of the Blind, I run a Braille display users group. So if anyone, um, you know, knows people that have Braille displays that might like to join that, that's also, and I'd love to talk to you guys about, you know, collaborating those things and figuring them out. I had a question about, I know at the beginning of COVID when you, created the, um, when you gave out the orbits, you also created um, the cards with books on them, I believe. And I thought that was such a, such a great idea to do that, that the person would already have things loaded with books. Like how, how did that part come about? Did, was that sort of a collaboration or how did you figure out uh, that that was a really great idea? Cause it, it really wasn't. And I felt jealous that you had all these books. I so I, I can speak to that. So that really was an RNIB project. Uh, the library service was suspended due to the closure of the building during the first uh, lockdown. So you weren't able to borrow a Braille book. And so as a little bit of a, a stopgap, uh, the RNIB 
sent to library members, existing Braille library members, Orbit readers with a card preloaded with uh, books because many of those readers didn't have the digital skills to, you know, go online, download the book, transfer it to the Orbit reader uh, and, and all the rest of it. So there was a recognition, I think, within RNIB that we needed to make that as easy as it possibly could be. I, I work at RNIB in my day job as a customer experience uh, manager. And so, yeah, the initial card, I think, had a, a, you know, a few hundred books. So it's 2,000 books now. And I think the next version of that card will probably have somewhere in the region of 6,000 books. And of course, as you know, the great thing about, you know, Braille files is they're tiny. So you can get lots and lots of them on uh, an SD card. Uh, so that is available to UK uh, Braille library uh, members, although we are aware there's been a lot of interest from overseas. And I hope with, you know, Marrakesh and the Accessible Books Consortium and all of that, uh, that libraries from around the world will work with RNIB's library so that we can promote um, more Braille availability everywhere. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation and, and for taking all of the questions that people have had. Um, it was very interesting. There's a lot of parallels with some of the work that Braille Literacy Canada has been doing, but I think uh, we can all learn from, from what's going on around the world as well. Uh, I think so we will have to get in touch <laughs> to talk more about it for 